Hi, everyone. Welcome to the meetup session for our multi bagger research series program. And a special welcome to all the new joiners whom we are meeting for the first time. Most of you already know us. For those who are here for the first time, this is Fania, and we have Rupan here. We are the co founders of MoneyWise Smart. And we also have Sean here, who has just joined us this year as our head of marketing. So this meetup is for two groups of people. You are either someone who has invested before, or you are looking to get started in investing this year. And if you have been following the markets, you all know that stocks were down significantly last year. Many stocks that produced great returns in the past two years suddenly collapsed, causing many people's portfolio to drop by half or more. As a result, many investors feel angry with themselves for following stock tips. And we know that some feel ashamed about losing money and some are even giving up on the market after taking a huge loss. So we know it's not easy, which is why we are holding this meetup. And today you'll discover how to select high quality businesses that can produce excellent returns on their capital employ. You'll also get to see how our multi bigger research series portfolio has performed in this regard. We are doing this because we want to help more people get access to proper financial education so that everyone can achieve the freedom that we deserve. And before we begin, I just want to be open about something. As you can probably tell, we are not professional speakers. We don't hold webinars every week and we spend most of time actually researching companies in depth because these are the companies we are personally invested in. And because of that, we can tell you that we are definitely not the most entertaining speakers, but we can show you how an investor can actually think and allocate his money. So we will share a lot of stuff today. There could be eye openers for many of you and you are only derived full value from this session if you stay till the very end. So in today's webinar, we'll talk about four key topics. First, we'll talk about what happened in 2022. What did the strong companies do and what can we learn from 2022? Next, we'll discuss five simple but important financial metrics and other factors to focus on in building a strong and resilient portfolio of companies. After that, we'll actually show you how to calculate these metrics let everyone do some exercises so that you can calculate so for the companies you own too. And lastly, we will look at how the companies that we cover under our multi bagger research series perform on these metrics and talk about some of the companies that perform well in the challenging year. So let's start with what happened in 2022 and what can we learn from 2022. If you have been following the stock market in 2022, or even if you do, you might have heard of your friends talking about this. In 2022, the stock market was in the red generally. So we can see here S&P 500 was down about almost 20%. And then NASDAQ index was down even more by 33%. Basically, many companies, especially the technology companies, were in the red. So Apple was down 27%, Microsoft down 29%, Alphabet down 39%, Tesla was down 65%, and Amazon was also down 50%. And many people who have invested heavily in technology companies were hit badly. And here are some of the top losers in 2022. For companies in the S&P 500 index, top losers like Match Group, Align Technology, Tesla, Meta, and PayPal dropped almost 60 to 70% in terms of their share prices. If we include companies in the NASDAQ index too, we see top losers like Coinbase, Farfetch, Roku, and Twilio losing even more, losing almost 80 to 90% in terms of their share price. And has anyone heard of this saying? Only when the tide goes out do you discover who has been swimming naked. So in the past few years, there have been a bull market. All the stocks are going up, or most of the stocks are going up. And some of the companies even went through the roof in, through, in terms of their share price, with many new investors getting a few hundred percent for their portfolio within one or two years. And they felt like they are super investors, having chosen the right companies at the right prices. In those years where interest rates were low and there were a lot of cheap funding and capital lying around, many companies were going all out on expansions with little regards to profitability and the quality of growth. And their valuations have been popped up to extremely high levels. But in 2022, when things turn around and the economy did not go well, the companies that are not strong or not well run be became exposed and they were hit badly operationally. So let's first look at what actually happened to the economy and businesses in 2022. First, the economy slowed down greatly in all regions of the world. The world GDP growth dropped from 
about 6% in 2021 to about 3% in 2022. And this was a case for both the advanced economies like the US or Europe or the emerging countries like China and India. Next, of course, we had a COVID-19 pandemic, which had caused lots of disruptions to the operations and supply chain of many companies. And then we also had rising inflation with consumer price index in the US going up significantly in 2022 to a high of more than 8% at a peak before coming back down to 6.5% at the end of the year. And also rising interest rates globally in the US, we see interest rate rising from almost 0% at the start of the year to 4.4% to the at the end of 2022. So how did these macroeconomic issues actually affect the businesses of the companies? So first, the economic slowdown led to most businesses experiencing unexpected slowdown in or even negative revenue growth. And the disruptions caused by COVID-19 on the operations or supply chain of the business also led to higher costs. And companies that have over expanded or are suffering losses now, they have to lay off many of their employees to improve their prof profitability. However, in this challenging environment, there are some companies that have always been disciplined in their growth in pursuing only quality growth. They are already highly profitable and generate lots of free cash flows and tasks are less affected by these issues and do not have to lay off employees to ensure that they have enough cash for their operations. Next, rising inflation. That means that consumers are generally more cautious with their spending and the rising costs also impact the businesses on their profit margins and cash flow generation. The strong companies that can manage inflation better are the ones that have strong pricing power supported by their moats. And for companies with existing strong free cash flows, they have enough cash flows to tighten them through the rising costs without having to slow down their growth plans. And for companies that are more capital light and have high return on capital, they generally need to invest less in fixed assets or working capital to grow their businesses. So the impact of rising costs of fixed assets and working capital affect them less compared to the companies that are more capital heavy. Imagine this, like if you are a manufacturer and you need to build more factories and buy more machineries to grow your business, then in the rising cost environment, the cost to build those factories and buy machineries go up. So you will be more impacted by the inflation compared to another business that is more capital light. Rising interest rates generally mean bad news for companies that have taken on lots of debt as they would have either have to incur higher interest expenses or if their debt is coming due, they have to refinance the debt at higher cost, unless they have sufficient cash or cash flows to pay down the debt without having to refinance. In addition, rising interest rate also means that the cost of capital is rising in general, where both the cost of debt and the cost of equity go up. So that means that the discount rate that you use in the discounted cash flow or DCF analysis to assess the value of a business also goes up and the value of the company actually comes down particularly for companies which have more of the cash flows in the future instead of cash flows now. And let me show you what I mean by this. Here, we have two companies. One company is quite profitable now and generates free cash flow of say 10 million a year. And let's just consider a 10 year DCF period with no terminal value for simplicity. And assume that this profitable company continues to generate 10 million every year from year one to year 10. Then we have a promising company that is incurring losses and has negative free cash flows now at negative 35 million a year in year one. And but it is expected to grow its free cash flow every year consistently to almost 60 million in year 10, six times that of the profitable company. So a question here, based on this information, which companies do you prefer? If you prefer the profitable company, type profitable in the chat. Or if you prefer the promising company, you can type promising in the chat. So first one, promising company by Chen. What about the rest? Promising company, promising. Sebastian says, depending on the stock price through, profitable. So looks like promising is in the win now. Like everyone likes the promising one. Profitable. Okay, now almost half half. Okay, let's see. So just based on those information just now, if we use a discount rate of 10% in our DCF, that means that a dollar after one year is worth less now and it's worth 91 cents if we use a 10% discount rate. 
and a dollar after two years is worth 83 cents now, and so on, as shown by this discount factor line. And the teal and red bars here basically show the discounted free cash flows of the two companies just now. If we now sum up all these discounted free cash flows, both companies, they actually come up to the same value where they are both worth 61 million today. So in terms of value today, they are actually the same despite having different cash flow profiles. However, when interest rate rises and say the discount rate increases to 15%, that means a dollar in the future is worth even less now because it gets discounted at a higher rate for many years, which you can see from these two blue lines where in year 10, a dollar is only worth 25 cents using a discount rate of 15% instead of 39 cents. So the difference between the two lines becomes wider further out into the future. And the companies that have free cash flows more weighted in the future are going to worth, be worth much less now compared to companies that already have strong free cash flows now. So under this higher 15% discount rate, the value of the profitable company would come down and it will come down to 50 million from the 61 million just now. But for the promising company, look at the value. It's going to drop even more because the impact is more and it drops to 34 million, which is almost half. So we as investors, we can't really predict where interest rates will go, but you can decide for yourself which type of companies you prefer to own in the long term. And we have just shown you the impact of a rising interest rate and cost of capital on the different type of companies. So is this concept clear to everyone? Or should I explain this again? If it's clear to you, type CF, which stands for cash flows, so that you understand how the discounting of cash flow works in different type of interest rate or cost of capital environment. So CF for cash flows. Okay, sounds like everyone has been following. That's great. Yeah. So when faced with rising interest rates, companies that have strong balance sheet with more cash and less debt and can self-fund its own growth with its own cash flows without having to raise capital, either debt capital or equity capital, they would do better. And from the valuation perspective, as we have just seen, companies with strong existing free cash flows instead of promising future free cash flows will be less impacted by the rising interest rates in terms of their valuation. And given that most companies' share prices dropped in the last year, the strong companies actually, they had uh, so much free cash flow and cash that they managed to make good use of the opportunities to buy back their shares massively to enhance shareholder values. For example, here we have Bank OZK spending about 65% of its net profit to buy back almost 7% 7 of its shares in 2022 at good prices. We also have Meta spending 55% of its operating cash flows to buy back about 6% of its shares. Alphabet spent about 65% of its operating cash flows to buy back 4% of its shares. Apple spent more spending 73% of its OCF to buy back 3.5% of its shares. And Adobe spent a whopping 84% of its operating cash flows to buy back about 3.3% of its shares. So these strong companies managed to improve their shareholder values by using their cash flows to buy back loss of shares at good prices at times when several companies were even struggling with their cash flows in 2022. So in money wise smart, this is where we pick our businesses from, where we look for strong resilient companies that fulfill the criteria that we have mentioned to help compound our wealth for the long term throughout different types of economic conditions. And coming back to our previous example of the profitable versus promising company, I think some of you mentioned promising company because you see the growth coming up. And in Money Wise Smart, we actually not only look for companies that have high existing profitability, we also look for companies that are growing well. So the duck, the blue bus, yeah. And for the previous example, it will be like a profitable company that is already earning 10 millions of free cash flow in the first year and then grows its free cash flow consistently over the years to 60 million in year 10. So we get the best of both worlds of high existing profitability and also high growth and certainties. Now, we are talk about some actual companies that faced some challenges in 2022. And I'll pass it to Rupam to go over them now. Okay, so uh, yesterday I posted a picture on our Facebook group 
showing the logos of six different companies and these are all high growth companies so they fall in that uh, promising category that fun yang showed and uh, i basically mentioned that all these six companies uh, they have something in common so it was it was a quiz question i asked people to uh, send me a uh, personal message uh, if you can guess what is that commonality that all these six companies uh, had and i actually uh, got the winner so after this section i'm going to announce the winner and the winner is actually present among us so uh, okay so here what i have done is i have just taken uh, two of those companies snowflake and uh, uipath and i'm going to uh, discuss that that factor which i referred to now you know most of you know snowflake was founded in 2012 uh, is a data lake warehousing and uh, sharing company that uh, came public in 2020. Now, to date, the company has over 3000 customers. And the most amazing thing is that includes nearly 30% of all the Fortune 500 companies. Uh, that's their customers. Uh, how amazing uh, uh, can that be? Now, uh, Snowflake's data lakes stores unstructured and semi-structured data that can then be used uh, in analytics to create insights uh, stored in its data warehouses. So it has some amazing technology. And uh, as we all know, the, the growth of Snowflake has been uh, phenomenal. So let's look at how the revenues uh, have been over the last uh, three years. Fanya, can you take us to the next slide? Uh, so uh, just look at this. Uh, 2020, their revenue was about 265 million. And the last 12 months, uh, that shot up to one point, almost 1.9 billion. So that's a CAGR of 103%. Now, that's the kind of, that's the kind of growth, that eye-popping growth that this business has uh, delivered. Now, the problem is, you know, such growth is very seductive. And most retail investors, they look at, and this is exactly what happened uh, in the year, you know, 2020, 2021, uh, that the, you know, people were talking about these, these growth, growth companies. So that, uh, so that's the reason why I have taken examples of some of these growth companies, just to demonstrate that when can growth be good growth and when growth can be harmful. Now, the problem is most retail investors, they don't pay attention to what goes in supporting the growth. And that is every business uh, needs, every business needs certain amount of capital to uh, run the operations of the business. And, uh, you know, the business then generates uh, a profit, the business maybe distributes part of the profit and retains uh, the balance amount uh, to you know, partly to uh, maybe uh, pay as maintenance capex and partly to support its growth. Now, let's see the the amount of capital that Snowflake uh, guzzled to support its growth. Uh, so, if you uh, if you look at the capital employed by Snowflake now to support this eye popping growth of a CAGR of one hundred and three percent. Snowflake's capital employed grew by a CAGR of 127% uh, year on year. This is compounded. So now the question which most investors do not ask and the question which we uh, urge our subscribers to ask is this uh, almost, you know, five and a half billion of capital that Snowflake took in, the, you know, Every capital, every dollar of capital has an opportunity cost. Uh, now, uh, Snowflake is not a profitable company, but it falls in the category of that promising company that Fan Liang showed. Now, the question is that this five and a half billion dollars that the owners of the company or the investors they, they put in, or you know, maybe the equity investors or the debt investors, that has an opportunity cost. Could this money have delivered a higher return? to the owners now unfortunately that is a question that most retail investors they do not ask now uh, 
right now for snowflake it's too early in the game it's just uh, you know i just uh, have uh, three three and a half years of uh, data on the screen so time will tell whether will snowflake become more capital uh, capital efficient uh, and uh, whether they will be at some point of time, you know, delivering a return on the capital that is being employed. Right now, there is no return. I mean, the company does not uh, generate any uh, any profits. But you know, it's an early stage company, so not generating a profit is not a uh, not a crime. But the question is to support this growth. If the business continues to guzzle so much capital, that is not necessarily a good thing. So here, the best way to understand this is a very simple example which Warren Buffett had used. And when many years back, when I read that, uh, that was like a light bulb moment, you know, aha moment. So just imagine uh, two simple bank accounts, a bank account A and a bank account B. Bank account A pays a 5% interest and bank account B pays 10% uh, interest. However, uh, let's say in both the accounts, you start with uh, hundred dollars and or let's say hundred thousand dollars and uh, after the end of the year whatever interest that is the uh, the ten thousand dollar interest that you earn in bank account b you take out that uh, that interest so bank account b is left with a capital of hundred thousand dollars again to generate another ten thousand dollars in the uh, subsequent year whereas in bank account a the total amount of interest that you earn is only five thousand dollars but what you do is after the first year you inject another $200,000 of principal in the bank account uh, bank account A. So, uh, or let, let me make it a round figure. Let's say you inject another $195,000 of capital. So you already had 100,000 plus 5,000 interest, that is 105,000 plus another 195,000. So now in the second year, you have $300,000 of capital in the bank account A, which means 5% of that bank account A will generate an earnings of $15,000. Now, if I compare just the earnings of these two accounts, I will see that in year one, in bank account A, the earnings was $5,000. And in year two, the earnings was $15,000. Whereas in bank account B, it's boring. Year one, bank account B generated $10,000. And year two, also bank account B generated $10,000. Now. In year 2020 and 2021, or you know, even before that, the inexperienced retail investors who were blindly chasing growth, they blindly flocked to bank account A, not realizing that there was 3x the amount of capital that went into bank account A as compared to bank account B. And in case of a business, there is no difference. So this reality, once you understand this reality, I mean, your, your whole notion of investing will, uh, will change. And you, know, you will start approaching the, uh, your investing from first principles. Now, uh, and uh, as you can see in Snowflake, that's exactly what has happened. So to deliver that eye-popping revenue growth, it required an amount of capital that was growing faster than that revenue growth. But there is another problem which this company had. Now, because most of these companies, they were not generating free cash flows, but at the same time, these are technology companies and you know they, to deliver that cutting edge uh, technology, they need high quality talent. So how do they attract the high quality talent? They don't have enough cash to pay the salaries. I mean, of course, they will pay salaries, but they have to pay uh, the employees in some other form to make it interesting for these uh, for these employees to work for them. And that is share based compensation, which is also a promise of the future. Now, uh, when we analyze businesses, any time we find a business that offers a, a share based compensation, SBC in short of more than 10% of its revenues, which is in double digits, we feel extremely uncomfortable. All these high quality businesses like be it Alphabet or you know, Facebook or Adobe, uh, they all uh, pay their employees some amount of uh, SBC, but it's all in single digits. Just look at the SBC of Snowflake. 
in year 2021, 50% of the revenue was given as uh, SBC to, to its employees. Now, do you think this is sustainable? Now, here is the, here is the problem. Now, while the revenues grew by a CAGR of 103%, the SBC grew by an eye-popping CAGR of 128%. Now, if the share price of this company keeps shooting up, you know, keeps going to the moon, then probably this company will get away by uh, paying so high SBC. Why? Beca because uh, effectively the company is not doing anything to compensate its employees. The company is giving a certain number of shares, but because the, you know, uh, this flock of large number of growth chasing retail investors, they are blindly uh, rushing into these companies and, and uh, pumping the share price, the employees feel richer and richer every day. But the problem happens when the share price falls. As we can see uh, from the next slide, now what do you think happens when the share price of a company paying so high SBC drops? The perceived value, let's say if I'm a high quality engineer working in this company and if I'm being compensated by 100 shares, now I will feel very, very good and you know, suitably compensated when the share price is at $400. But when the share price falls to uh, $200 or uh, $150, then my perceived value of that compensation is much less. So what do you think the company will need to do to keep me motivated? The company will need to pay me even more shares. So this is like this classic hamster wheel that uh, these high growth promising businesses without any cash flows they find themselves in now as long as the going is good that is as long as the share price keeps going up you know they get away doing that they probably use their share price as a currency to raise more capital to fund their the uh, you know uh, aggressive uh, growth but when the tide goes out as fan liang uh, showed that saying you know that's when you get to see uh, who is uh, swimming naked now uh, by the way, a falling share price like what happened in 2022 is not a bad thing. We celebrate when share prices drop because as Fan Liang showed for the strong businesses, what do you think what do you think Tim Cook will prefer? Will Tim Cook the, let's let's hear a poll. Will Tim Cook uh, like it when Apple share price keeps going up or will he, prefer that Apple share price uh, goes down. Uh, any business which is buying back massive amount of shares, they will absolutely prefer. They don't think like a stock speculator. When you think like a business owner, it's in your interest if your share price is below your intrinsic value because with the huge amount of free cash flow that a business like Apple generates, they will be able to buy back the shares at a much more uh, preferable price. So just to give you some perspective, Apple have uh, returned over half a trillion dollars. That is almost you know, $550 billion. That is uh, more than a GDP of uh, a country like uh, Israel to its shareholders in form of buybacks. So the high quality businesses who generate a lot of free cash flow, they their owners will actually be uh, in a much better position when their share price comes down because the business will be able to buy back the shares at much more uh, uh, favorable rates. Whereas in case of a, uh, and I would call Snowflake, whatever high tech the technology might be, when it comes to finance 101, it's a very poor quality business because if to sustain its business, it has to guzzle so much capital and it has to uh, it has to give out 50% or 40% of its revenues as stock based compensation then share price coming down puts the company in a very very tricky situation so let's look at the, the next company uh, uipath now here again the, the same thing even more stock uh, to support a revenue growth of 50% cagr uipath needed uh, the capital employed grew by 108% uh, CAGR. 
Now, these are some of the companies that created a lot of excitement. But unfortunately, uh, all these retail investors who were rushing into these growth companies, they were not looking under the bonnet. And if we look at uh, the SBC of UiPath, uh, just, just look at this. In 2022, almost 58% of the revenue had to be paid out as uh, SBC. And well, why is that? Uh, I mean, congrats, they had brought it down to 33%, which by itself is ridiculously high. Uh, it's simply because if we look at the next slide, look how UiPath's share price had come down. Now, today, if one of our businesses, if the share price comes down like this, we will actually be very happy because we have the free cash flows. We have other forms of generating cash to be able to buy the stock. But you saw UiPath had to increase its uh, its SBC to almost 58% of its uh, of its revenues. So uh, so yesterday the question that I uh, posted, uh, Jivko, who is here, uh, I hope I'm, I'm uh, pardon me if I'm pronouncing your name wrong. So he was the first person to uh, answer correctly. He uh, he messaged me. So uh, you are the winner. And uh, you know we like we like giving uh, books as gifts. So uh, so my colleagues will be uh, in touch with you to uh, if you can uh, let them know uh, which address you would like uh, the book to send to, and we will also you know uh, give you a few options. Some of the books that we have read uh, recently, and we think uh, they can be really helpful. To uh, so congratulations, uh, Jipko. So you know so. Uh, that's basically what I wanted to share. Uh, Pan Liang, over to you. Yep, thanks, Rupam. That's a good one, and congratulations, Zico, again. So, we hope you understand the importance of cash flows now, CF for cash flows. And now, what should we investors do to look for and monitor strong, resilient companies that can perform well through different economic conditions? Are there actually any quick financial metrics that we can focus on? Let's have a look at five simple but important financial metrics now. As we have discussed just now, we want companies that have pricing power to help pass on the impact of rising inflation. So one indicator of pricing power is having high gross profit margin. Next, we want companies that are already generating strong free cash flows now instead of in the future to be able to withstand economic downturns and be less impacted by changes in interest rate. So we want companies with high free cash flow margin, but free cash flow can fluctuate quite a lot in certain years if the company makes certain major capital expenditure. Coming back to the financial metrics, we also want companies with high return on capital because they will be less impacted by rising inflation and they generally also require less external funding to grow since they are more capital light. And here we can look for companies with high return on capital employed or in short ROCE. And lastly, we want companies with strong balance sheet, either with low net debt to equity ratio, which means that they are not that leveraged, or if they have some debt, ensure that they have high interest cover so that they would have enough operational cash flows buffers to pay off the interest expenses even when they are increasing. And these five financial metrics are what Juan Smith track for his portfolio too. So yes, he's Terry Smith whom many call the English version of Warren Buffett. And he founded Fundsmith, an investment management company. And his equity fund, as you can see here, has generated a compounded return of about 16% a year over the past 12 years since inception in late 2010. It outperformed the SMCI World Index, which returned about 11% a year during that period. So what's special about Fundsmith investment strategy? You might be surprised at how simple it is. So Fundsmith's investment strategy is basically buy good companies, don't overpay, and then do nothing. Does that sound simple to you? So when Fundsmith says do nothing, they mean holding on to the companies for a long time and let those businesses compound. However, when they say they do nothing, they are not really doing nothing. They're actually monitoring the company to see if they remain strong. And the key metrics that they monitor for their companies are uh, actually what we have just discussed just now on the five financial metrics. This is a table taken from the latest Fundsmith shareholder letter, which tracks the financial performances of its portfolio companies versus how the companies in S&P 500 or FTSE 100 perform. As you can see here, on one of the most important metrics, 
ROC, the return on capital, and Broid. Fund Smith portfolio companies consistently generates high 20% over the year. And it even shot up to 32% in 2022 when the economy was not good, much higher than the 16 to 18% for the average market. The gross profit margin at mid 60% and operating profit margin at high 20% are also much higher than the general market. And those accounting profits actually get converted well into free cash flows. With the free cash flow conversion, we can see here coming close to about 100% in most of the years. And they also have high interest cover and are not at risk of not being able to pay down any debt obligations to survive long and not go under. So of course, these five financial metrics just touch on the quantitative sides. And there are also other important factors to look out for in the good companies to invest in particularly strong modes or competitive advantages, and also good capital allocation skills. So strong modes to help the company sustain pricing power and continue to be able to earn high returns on capital in this capitalistic world, where high returns naturally attract competition, which will reduce those returns. The concept of modes has been widely talked about, so you can read through some of the quotes here, and we'll spend a bit more time talking about capital allocation instead which is less commonly discussed. So capital allocation is basically what the company does with the capital generated or raised by the company, including the operational or free cash flows generated every year. As Warren Buffett says here, how a company allocates capital has a huge impact on the intrinsic value of the business. If we think about a business in the long term, say in 10 years, if a company retains earnings equal to 10% of its equity every year, then the CEO would have been responsible for the deployment of more than 60% of all capital at work in the business, which is a huge amount. And even if a company generates lots of free cash flows, if those free cash flows are not allocated or deployed well, their value can actually be diminished or wasted away. And here we are showing you now a bad case of capital allocation. I'm sure most of you know JD.com, which is one of the largest e-commerce company in China, together with Alibaba. And JD.com has been generating lots of free cash flows due to its strong core business and negative networking capital cycle. As you can see here, as shown by the two bars, in 2019 to 2021, it had been generating about 24 to 35 billion RMB of free cash flows each year. And that's on top of lots of capital infused into the business through its secondary offering and also the spin-off of its many subsidiaries. However, it had barely deployed those capital and barely done any buybacks. So the cash has just been accumulating on its balance sheet, resulting in its net cash shooting up to about 157 billion RMB here at the end of 2021, as shown by the light blue line. And in mid-2022, it distributed out a special dividend of 13 billion RMB, which was minor compared to its net cash amount. So it's still holding a lot of cash. And even for that dividend distribution, the return on capital to shareholders will have been better done through share buybacks, given its low share price then. So although JD's operating business is very strong, with strong modes, the way the management has been allocating the capital and free cash flows can actually dilute the shareholder return. To explain this point better, let's look at a DCF calculation to examine the impact of cash hoarding by a business. For simplicity, let's use back the example just now of that profitable company that we discussed earlier, where the profitable company generates free cash flow of 10 million a year for 10 years. It's a discount of 10%. The business is worth 61 million today. Here, something that you should take note of when using a DCF analysis to estimate the value of a business is that an implicit assumption in the DCF is that the free cash flows in each year, they are reinvested at the same rate as the discount rate, that is 10% in this case, either by the shareholders if the free cash flows are distributed to them, or by the company if the cash flows are returned. So in JD's case, most of the free cash flows are not returned, but they are parked as cash or short-term investments, earning minimal returns, much less than the discount rate. So in this case, the value of the business will be quite lower than the 60 million calculated in this DCF. And that's one way how bad capital allocation can actually destroy or dilute the value to shareholders despite the company having an amazing operating business. 
for those of you who have been following us for some time, you will know that we have spent a lot of time researching JD.com, probably one of the earliest company we have researched together with a mastermind group of friends. And we have been monitoring it for many years throughout all these years. And we really like the company. However, we are not the type of company whom once we have done lots of work, we get emotionally attached. We like to stay objective. So when the facts change, we happily change our mind. And we also like to demonstrate this objectivity to our subscribers. So our subscribers can be sure that we will not sugarcoat our research and point out just the good things. When we find out negative things like for JD throughout the many years, we also highlight them because that's how we can ensure that we stick to the highest quality companies in the long run. The Lian, back capital, uh, yeah. Can I just, can I just uh, interrupt once? Can I request yeah. you to go back to the previous slide where you showed now this is actually a this is actually a very very important concept which you just uh, uh, you know touched upon and i think we should uh, spend a couple of minutes more on on this now you know a lot of people learn how to do a simple dca for even if they are not doing it on excel in mentally they are they are doing it and uh, you know as uh, funny has showed that you know this business is generating free cash flow every year so you know you come up with uh, a discount rate and you discount it uh, to the present and you arrive at the value. However, the part which most people, I mean, I would say more than 99% of investors or even more, they do not pay attention to is the fact that this assumption that uh, a DCF assumes that this the 10 million, which is uh, being generated every year is also being invested at a 10% rate of return. Now, Unfortunately, there is no easy way to find that. Now, you can uh, you can sit and you can you know make a reasonable projection uh, of how a business is going to grow, but there is no Yahoo Finance or no Morningstar or anything that will just give you a uh, a very easy explanation of a business's capital allocation. To get an idea we have to go back and, and read the past annual reports to see what the business has actually done with the cash that it has generated. And sometimes the divergence that we find between what you know we would have assumed and what the business is actually doing is very, very stark. Just to give you one example, Apple. Now, till few years back, now Apple always was an amazing operating business, but to Till few years back, Apple's capital allocation was not great. It was generating huge amounts of cash, but the returns that it was generating on that cash was very, very suboptimal. And that's when Apple started paying out dividends and started buying uh, buying back shares. And and you know the rest is history. So the so this is one thing that everybody should keep in mind that just studying an operating business is not enough. Will not cut it. You have to look at the history. Uh, and understand the capital allocation track record of of these uh, CEOs. Sorry, Panyan, over to you. Yep, no, that's that's a very good point, Rupam. So, and there are even books like Outsiders talking about the best CEOs being very good capital locators in history, and those are the CEOs we want to look for in running our business. Because if not, then the return to us as shareholders could be diluted or amplified, depending on how good the capital allocation skill is. And here's another example, totally opposite from JD.com, where one of our companies covered in our multi bagger research series process. And just now, I think Connor in the chat has also pointed out this company process has been doing lots of capital allocation activities, proactively doing them well to improve shareholder value, even without having to make any changes to the operations of the business that these two parts are, can be separate. And we have discussed what process is doing in our meetup last year. So we won't go over it again today. And for MRI subscribers, you can watch the recording on Digible. You have access to all those videos and modules. So have a look at the term to see what good capital allocation is. So coming back to the five financial metrics we discussed just now, do you know how do the companies in your portfolio perform on those metrics? And do you track them over time? And does anyone want to know how to calculate all these metrics and see some examples, do some exercises together, Type yes if you want to see some calculations and examples, and we'll do it together so that you can actually understand them and internalize them. Okay, I see a few yeses. Yep. So I think there'll be enough participation. So now let's 
show you how to calculate the metrics using actual examples of companies covered in our multi-bagger research series. And after this session, you can do it for the companies that you own. As a refresher, these are the five financial metrics we were looking at. Let's start with the easy ones, gross profit margin and operating profit margin. So Adobe, this is the latest financial statement of Adobe for the last financial year, ending December 2022. So for GPM and OPM, what numbers should we take to calculate the gross profit margin and operating profit margin? This one should be easy. Yes, for GPM, we take the gross profit divided by revenue. And we can see here Adobe has a high GPM of almost 88%, which could indicate pricing power. Think about it, say, if you are a designer and you have been used to using Photoshop and need it for your work, if Adobe increases the subscription price by 10%, how likely are you to cancel and switch? And then moving on to OPM. So we take the operating profit, which is 6 billion here, divided by the revenue, which is 18 billion. And we get 35% operating profit margin for Adobe. So Adobe is one of those companies that already has high existing profitability, even after investing a lot on sales and marketing and R&D. And it is profitable and it, those profits are also growing instead of the other type of company where we've shown just now the promising type of company. That's why even though Adobe has been growing its headcount at quite a fast rate in the past few years, adding about more than 3,000 employees a year in the past two years, in late 2022, it laid off only about 100 employees, which is less than 0.5% of its total headcount. And that's mainly in the sales team, which was minor compared to some other companies. And Adobe was also reportedly giving those who were laid off the opportunity to find other positions in the company. Now for Adobe, not only Adobe has high existing profit margins, its free cash flows are even higher due to high free cash flow commission. So let's look at how to calculate free cash flow commission. And here's the latest cash flow statement for Adobe. So this one is probably a bit harder to calculate than the previous ones. Here we'll calculate free cash flow before acquisitions to see what free cash flow commission is for. It's called organic business, where we take the operating cash flow minus of the SPC expenses because they are real cost to the business, and then we minus off the capex. And the free cash flow commission is basically the free cash flow amount divided by the net profit figure, which gives us 124% here for Adobe. So what's Adobe's secret for high free cash flow commission? Why can it be higher than 100%? The main reason is deferred revenues, where Adobe is selling subscriptions, so it collects the fees in advance first before even during the services. So Adobe has access to those cash flows first before the revenues are recorded. And it's good for shareholders because ultimately the value of a company is a discounted future free cash flow of the business. If you use net profit to value Adobe instead of free cash flows, then you could be undervaluing, undervaluing Adobe. So I hope you realize the importance of free cash flows. And having free cash flow commission is important because it enables Adobe to grow fast organically with minimal capex and net working capital needs without having to rely on external funding as it is able to generate lots of free cash flow to fund its own business and at the same time still being able to distribute lots of cash back to shareholders, which has been doing through buybacks. Next on return on capital employed or ROC, here's Evolution's latest income statement and balance sheet. ROC is calculated as pre-tax operating profit divided by capital employed. For operating profit, you can get it from the income statement, which is 908 million euro here. For capital employed, there are two ways you can calculate it. First, you look at how much equity capital and also debt or long-term liabilities have gone into funding the business. Here, the equity is 3,460 million. Total long-term liabilities is 483 million. And within current liabilities, the current lease liabilities are like current debt. So we add in the 40 million too. And we get almost 4 billion euro of capital employed. So the ROC in 2022 was 23%. The second way to look at capital employed is to think about what assets are used to run the business. Minus of the current liabilities, which are non-interest bearing, which are used to support the business too. So let's look at the ones box up in the blue boxes here. We have non-current assets, and then we add on the current assets, and we net off the current liabilities, except the current lease liabilities. And because of balance sheet balances, so regardless of which way you do it, you should get the same answer. It's just two different ways or perspectives to look at capital employed. So is this clear? And do you think a ROC of 23% is high? 
type yes if you think it's high, type no if you think it's no. Now let's look at evolutions ROC before 2022. As you can see here from the solid line, it had been even higher at about 50% in the past, but it dropped significantly to 11% in 2020. What happened? So let's look at the balance sheet. In 2020, evolutions total assets shot up from less than half a billion to 3.2 billion. And most of the increase was because of a large acquisition of a company called NetEnt. So the goodwill amount increased by almost 2 billion. And when total capital employed jumped a lot, then ROC dropped because ROC is calculated as operating profit divided by capital employed. And someone who just look at Evolution's normal ROC might think that, oh, the business has deteriorated a lot from the drop off ROC. However, in Money by Smart for us, we look at both the ROC including and ROC including or excluding goodwill. And for evolution, you can see here, the ROC excluding goodwill still remain high at about 55% in 2022. Our MRI subscribers will know what's the difference between ROC including and excluding goodwill and why we calculate both and how we can think about both of them from our previous discussions on evolution, which can be found on Teachable. Which is why so far evolution has been able to grow its net profit fast. Look at the tail line where it's growing at 34% to 113% every year without having to consume much capital. So it still has lots of free cash flow that it has been distributing back to shareholders at the same time through both dividends and also some buybacks. The last one on interest cover is easy to calculate. Basically, how many years of interest expense can the operating pays for? And Evolution has almost six, more than 600 years that it can pay for using its operating profit. So it's not really leveraged and doesn't have much debt. And these are the companies you want to look out for. And now let's look at how the companies we are covered in our MRS perform on those metrics. So in MRS, we are covering about 16 companies now in the midst of researching the 17 company. We keep track of all these companies on their earnings and important developments, and also monitor their financial performances on these five metrics we discussed earlier. For existing subscribers, you have access to this summary table in the MRS summary, summary relation Google Sheet. So we are watching these 16 companies now, which continue to expand. And from this universe of 16 companies, although they are great companies, there are also several issues that we have highlighted before with some of the companies. And some of them might not have a long track record yet. So we would like to give it more time to monitor them. So we have identified the companies that fall into the top tier category as of now. As shown here, there are five, nine, nine of them. And we buy them when they are available at good prices. That's how we ensure we maximize our long-term returns. And like I said just now, it's important to know that just because uh, we are researching a company, it doesn't mean that we will buy them. We might find good things about it, but we might also find bad things about it. And some of them we are monitoring. So even though these nine companies are top tier now, it doesn't mean that we are recommending you to buy the companies. We are just monitoring them closely. And in the MRI summary relation spreadsheet, you can see the most recent relation range that we have done on these companies and the relevant teachable modules explaining those relations. And besides that column, you see the latest share price from Google Finance. So you can easily see where the current share price stands compared to the intrinsic value range. And these are not recommendations, but you could consider thinking of your portfolio in a similar way as how we think about our own portfolio. And back to this table, you can see that most of the top tier companies we cover in MRS have high existing ROC. That's very important. And they have about 20% to 50% ROC in recent years. At the bottom of this table, we also calculate the averages for all the 16 companies and also the average for the nine top tier companies. And we'll see the averages in chart form soon. The MRS companies we research into also have high gross profit margin of about 40% to 90%. Operating profit margin with the exception of two companies. All the rest have already shown a track record of achieving high operating profit margins. So they are already profitable and don't really need external funding. And free cash flows. We have been talking about cash flows all this time. So for MIS companies, their profits also convert well into free cash flows. And some of them even have free cash flow conversion of more than 100%, which is even better. And basically, for interest cover, you can see here. The MRS companies are not leveraged much. Either they do not have net debt, they do not incur net interest expense, or if they do, they have such high interest cover. And like I said, it's important so that when economic times are bad, they can still survive well and we can sleep peacefully at night as investors. So these are the averages for the 16 MRS companies, all the companies. And note that financial year 2022, not every company has reported yet, so it's less comparable. And just look at the ROC here. The average ROC is about mid to high teens, which is very important because in the long run, 
your long-term investor return cannot sustainably exceed the return on capital of your companies. This is a fact. And then on gross profit margin is about 60 plus percent range, operating profit margin is about mid 20% range and free cash flow commotion has been around 70% to 100% because some of the companies are still investing aggressively on capex to grow their business. So the commotion is less than 100%. Now we added in the dotted lines, which are the averages for the top tier companies, the nine top tier companies. And on ROC, we can see here the top tier companies have even higher ROC of 20% or more. And although their gross profit margin are slightly lower, but they have higher operating profit margin and free cash flow commercials are also high at about 75% to 100% mainly. Now let's look at some of the MIS companies that were still growing well in 2022. As we all know, throughout 2022, there have been massive layoffs by these tech companies. You can see here, Tesla, Snap, Twilio, Amazon, etc. And they have laid off more than like, tens of thousands of employees each. However, some MRS companies were actually accelerating their hiring in 2022, doing the opposite to hire more to support their future growth friends. Here we have Evolution, which have hired another 3.6 thousand employees, which is a 27% growth. And for Adyen, it actually accelerated its hiring, hiring a massive 1.2 thousand employees in 2022. And that's a 53% growth, almost two or three times what they used to hire. It could do so because in the previous years when many companies were projecting high growth and aggressively hiring without much discipline to cost, Adyen wasn't. The CEO, CFO said that they've always built the company in a very disciplined way and kept the bar high even if it means they can't hire enough people. And every new hire in Adyen has to be has to meet one of the senior management team at least once before being hired. So these companies can hire massively in 2022 because they have the profitability, they have the cash flows, to do so and they still see good revenue growth and opportunities and it's one of the best times to hire because when everyone is firing off their their employees especially the high quality tech employees then this is the best time to look for those talents and let's see how these two companies perform in 2022 for those not familiar with evolution is a global leader in providing games to the operators in the online industry more than 80 percent market share in europe also one of the top leaders globally and it has been over time consolidating the market growing organically and also acquiring companies and widening its modes. In 2022, it grew its revenue by 36%. And at the same time, it also improved its profit margins while hiring 27% more employees. So its EBITDA margin improved to 69%. Net profit margin improved to 58%. How high is that? And as we have seen earlier, it has a high ROC of 55% excluding Google. How many companies do you know have high profit margins of 58%, high ROC of 55%, managed to grow revenue well in 2022 amidst the economic slowdown. Next, Adyen is a Dutch payments company where it helps businesses to accept and process payments on the back end whenever a consumer pays online or in store. Unlike the traditional players where many different players are involved in the whole payment chain, Adyen handles the whole payment chain related tasks on its own single platform that it has built from scratch so that it has access to all the data seamlessly and can do everything faster and better. When you purchase services or products from companies here like Airbnb, Spotify, Uber, Tesla, there's a high chance that that payment is processed by Adyen. In 2022, despite its customers facing slowdown, Adyen's process revenue and net revenue actually grew fast at 49% and 33% respectively, partly due to the success of its land and expense strategy, where it not only benefits from its customers' growth, but also increasingly taking more wallet share of the customers where a customer might start out using Adyen in one of the countries or business segments, and after seeing how good Adyen solutions are, proceed to use Adyen for more things. Adyen's strong customer base and success in then and expand help it to grow its revenue sustainably in the future, where more than 80% of its annual growth actually comes from existing customers spending more instead of from new customers. On profitability, there's some concern about slowdown in profitability, where EBITDA grew only 16%, which is still very good. And the reason for the slower profit is because Adyen is investing heavily in 2022 to grow for future expansion. And the CFL said that they can easily get back to the same profitability level if they want, because those expansions are not needed to run the current operations today. So even with the depressed profitability in 2022, Adyen's ROC was still high at about 25%. So that's a quick discussion of Evolution and Adyen and their latest performances in 2022. We have talked about these companies in detail, a lot more detail on Teachable. As you can see from the screen here, there are modules in which we discuss Adyen, sorry, Evolution, and then followed by Adyen. And for MRS subscribers, 
we monitor the derailments of the companies covered under MRS, including earnings updates, and we highlight any issues that we discover over time in our WhatsApp group and also on Teachable, so our subscribers will be aware of them and can sleep in peace while owning the companies. And that's all that we are covering today. We have covered quite a few topics in this meetup based on what we have presented so far. Now to identify such strong companies with and monitor their development over time, it requires a, a lot of work, including in-depth analysis of many years of financials, reading of a lot of annual reports. For our MOI subscribers, we have you all covered. We do the heavy lifting for you by reading all the documents and summarize the findings in easy to digest format, like the summary evaluation Google Sheet that we showed you earlier, which contains the financial metrics of the companies over the years, together with commentaries on their positive and negatives and their valuations and share prices. At MoneyWise Smart, we do deep dive research into wonderful companies to own for the long term. We have provided some of these research for free in our free research series. So definitely check them out at the link provided if you want to invest in good companies. I promise you will really benefit a lot from this research. If you have enjoyed this video, do hit the like button now and don't forget to subscribe and hit the notification bell so that you'll be notified of our future videos. Do also join our Facebook group where we discuss interesting investment concepts and businesses. Thank you for watching and see you in our next video.